was really a completely haphazard thing, really. Um, I need to make a um, a point of statement so you understand where I'm coming from. I was born in Argentina, in the province of San Luis, which is very similar to many parts of the Sonoran Desert. It's mountain ranges, at least that part of San Luis. It's mountain ranges, mesquite woodlands, and creosote bushes. Uh, it's almost identical. The dominant plants and the physiognomy is very, very similar to the Sonoran Desert. And that was my childhood. I, I, I was brought up in a ranch and I used to ride on horseback like every day. Um, and, and that's where I was, I was raised. And then I studied and became, uh, wanted to become a researcher, became a young researcher, published some research papers. Um, and Not to have a big mouth, press, and to, uh, critical opinions, very vociferously about um, the military rulers in Argentina that came in the, in the 1970s. And as a result of that, I appeared in a couple of lists of people to be disappeared. And through, again, haphazard reasons, I was, I, I, I was able to know that I was on the list of people that were to be kidnapped. And I was fortunate enough to have some friends help me out, including among them the British consulate in Buenos Aires who gave me a scholarship to go to the United Kingdom. So I went to the UK, I studied my master's degree there, and that's as far as a British council would um, help me, and then came to Mexico, got a job in Mexico. Mexico has always been a very generous country with um, outcasts like myself. I uh, started working in Mexico in mangroves in Tabasco, in the tropical rain area of, of the Gulf, the southern, very tropical, very rainy area of the Gulf of Mexico. And I was working there, and uh, at one point I decided I needed a PhD, and I needed a subject for a PhD. And it was almost like magic. I wrote to my university in Wales, where I had done my master's, and I said, is there any way I can do my PhD? but working, doing my field work in Mexico. And they said, oh yeah, by all means, you did a master's here, you completed all your credits, the only thing you'd need is a dissertation in order to get a PhD, and if you can come twice a year uh, for around a, four, uh, a fortnight or more for four years and, and give seminars on your progress and talk with your supervisor, you can do your field work in Mexico, there's no problem. Um, so I said, okay, uh, my university has accepted me, and I can keep my position in Mexico. I was working at that time in Mexico, uh, initially at the Natural History Museum in Mexico City, then at UNAM, at the University of Mexico. I said, but then the other thing I need is um, a subject. And then, at that time, magically, Samuel Ocaña, who was governor of Sonora, came to Mexico City, and he said, he talked with the director of the Natural History Museum in, in Mexico City, in Chapultepec, and he said, I've heard that you guys are implementing or proposing this new approach to conservation, which is the concept of biosphere reserves, which is a concept that has been developed by the Man and the Biosphere Program in UNESCO, and I would be interested to implement that, that concept in Sonora. And, and he told uh, Gonzalo Halfter, the director of the Natural History Museum at that time, he said, I would in particular like to implement it as a protected area in the Pinacate. But he said, we know nothing about the Pinacate. We know it's pretty, but not much more than that. Um, so we need somebody to go there and do a sort of resource inventory and vegetation analysis of the Pinacate. And so Gonzalo turned around to me and said, can you do this? And I said, yeah, that's great, because it will give me a subject for my PhD. And I said, yeah, I would love to do it. And so I traveled to the Pinacate. I flew to Hermosillo, and then I flew to the Pinacate. And when I saw the place, it was like my childhood again. It was, it was a place I was familiar, an environment I was familiar with. It was drier than San Luis. San Luis is like three, San Luis is more like Tucson. Um, but but it was a desert environment with mesquites and ironwood and cacti and creosote bushes. It was a type of environment I was familiar with and I loved. 
And so uh, I started working on the Pinacate to A, get my PhD degree, and B, to uh, craft a proposal to create a biosphere reserve, a huge protected area on the Gran Desierto dunes and the Pinacate volcanic uh, shield. And that's, that's how I got to the, to the region. It's interesting that you uh, talk about feeling familiarity uh, with the Pinacates. A number of people we've interviewed use the phrase, it was like coming home, I felt I found my place. So in some sense, you had an emotional identity with this arid and in some ways fairly forbidding place, at least to outsiders. Yes. Um, around that time, uh, I learned for the first time about this concept that then many have pursued, and particularly Gary Napham has pursued very well, uh, the concept developed by Wallace Stegner, that is the idea of sense of place. And in my case, I have to say, it wasn't like a, I wasn't like an immediate convert to the desert environment. What happened is I had grown up in an environment like that. So I had a sense of place for those plants and, and for that environment. Um, but, but, but yes, the idea of a sense of place, some people can actually identify with, uh, with environments like that. Many other people cannot, as a matter of fact, feel... Uh, I wrote, I was... <laughs> this is very, very funny uh, that you know we're talking about this now. Some years ago, I published a paper in Spanish, and I can send you a reprint. I think I have it somewhere in my computer. Um, in Mexico about Charles Darwin and his confrontation with desert environments and he hated them. Uh, you know Darwin took off from England, he stopped on the Cape Verde Islands that are as the name suggests quite green and then in the Brazilian um, coastal fog forest, the Floresta Atlantica or Mata Atlantica and then from there they sailed directly to Patagonia and he landed in Patagonia and, and the things he writes, he has this acute sense of anxiety, as a matter of fact, yeah. just by looking at the open landscapes and um, and uh, the dry vegetation and the desert environment and the wind and all that. And, and he called it a cursed land, a uh, horrible place, no interest. He, he kept using this, this phrase, this place is completely uninteresting. But he writes in his diary, in the diary of the Beagle, he writes like his first landing in Patagonia he devotes like 10, 12, 12 pages, while on, on the Brazilian rainforest he only writes four pages, you know, like this place was so uninteresting that he wrote, it, 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 it led him to write like crazy. Um, and, uh, and then uh, when he reaches the Atacama Desert in Chile, he writes the same thing. Uh, there's one point in Patagonia that he says, if Brazil made me think about life, this place makes me think about death. He had this, this acute anxiety by living in a, in a desert environment. And then he goes to the Galapagos, which are also dry, and he hated the Galapagos. <laughs> and as you well know, he made some of the most important natural history observations in, in the Galapagos. I mean, I, I, I personally believe that, that the seed of uh, natural selection and, and the basic mechanisms of evolutionary theory were developed by Darwin in the Galapagos while he was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and he calls it, uh, as, as he leaves the Galapagos, he said that he, he thinks he has hit on the mystery of mysteries, uh, which is the origin of life. Um, and, uh, but, but he didn't like it. Um, and some people love the desert, other people just don't like it, uh, find it uh, too overbearing. Mm -hmm. what? I'm, uh, excuse me, Wendy, I was going to say that uh, one of the things about this uh, book fair a lot of desert people talked about feeling threatened in the desert, and in fact, they seem to enjoy talking about hardship uh, in the desert. Do you think that there's something to this uh, sort of attraction to overcoming hardship, being alive even though threatened? Bill Broyles talked about locking himself in the car in the middle of June to see how long he could last, and the answer was about an hour and a half. <laughs> Well, he's <laughs> that sounds like crazy, um, but but yeah, uh, there is a certain challenge in um, 
in knowing that you know how to survive in an environment where most people wouldn't survive. Good, um, And that I had it since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I'm not proud of the things we did, but, um, um, you know, I used to live in a ranch, and when you're brought up in a ranch, you really become tough. And we used to get cousins coming from Buenos Aires to visit us, and we loved doing, just making them suffer. Uh, you know, like going for walks that we know they couldn't take, or uh, riding horses, you know, for eight hours the first day, so we know they would be sore for, for a week um, after that or um, going into places where finding water was really difficult and taking no, no water and, and seeing how they were becoming uh, anxious and, and, and suffering because of this. Uh, that gives you, I have to say I'm not proud of it, but uh, uh, Helen, you, you've hit a point there. It gives you a sense that, that you can do certain things, that you're adapted to an environment where many people are not and, and that you can understand that environment and survive in it, um, and that gives you an exhilarating feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I n never thought about it. It's really interesting. But now, now we're talking. I'm sort of elaborating on it. When you um, started researching, who else was doing research at the time there, or was it a complete blank slate? No, it wasn't a complete blank slate. As it turned out. First of all, uh, one of the things I learned very, very rapidly was the monumental legacy of work that existed for the Sonora Desert. And um, all the way from the Jesuit fathers uh, that did wonderful natural history work. I immediately bought, a, after my first visit to Sonora, I bought Miguel del Barco's uh, Chronicles of Antigua, California. Mm -hmm. I bought um, Father Nentwick um, El Rudo Ensayo, which I thought it was, because in Spanish you can translate it into many different ways. It can be the harsh trials, but it can also be the harsh essay, mm -hmm. uh, as, as in writing. It's a beautiful title. Mm -hmm. And El Rudo Ensayo, it's a beautiful description of all the areas. Um, I had the luck at that time of going to Seville. And it was almost like a religious experience. I went to the archive of the Indies, El Archivo de Indias, to see Falquino's original map of the Pinaria, which is there. And I realized that so much work had been done in that region. And of course, from there onwards, I learned very rapidly about Jeffrey Sykes and his work in the Sonoran Desert and uh, in the Pinacate and the, um, sorry, not so much in the Pinacate, in the, in the Delta, of course, his book uh, with the Carnegie Institution of Washington on the, on the Colorado River Delta. I learned that I didn't know, I got a first edition uh, of uh, Lumpold's um, New Trails in Mexico. I also got Hornaday's Campfires on Deserts and Lava. Um, uh, I got, this is something that most Americans don't know that well, uh, the publications by Fernando Jordan on Baja California. Uh, his, his travel logs on Baja California with, are amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, and realize how much collaboration had existed. Um, that's where I first became acquainted with the Natural History Museum in San Diego also, mm -hmm. because George Lindsay, who was for a while in San Diego and then in, the, in Cal Academy, and Reed Moran, the botanist, they had done amazing work in Mexico, and they had done a lot of collaborative work with uh, researchers in, in, in Mexico, including the beautiful story of Isla Raza. Mm -hmm. um, and so, basically, I won't keep on going because I can keep on going. I just published, a, in the Journal of the Southwest, I just published a long monographic paper with a couple of colleagues called The Cartographers of Life, which is basically the history of the people doing natural history in, in Baja California. Uh, there's, one of the first things I learned is this, this amazing legacy. Mm -hmm. How many great people. Uh, had done 
amazing research in in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, the Did other you thing study I, these people directly, or were they mostly people you read? There were people I read. Not, none of the ones I mentioned were alive when I started doing work. Okay. Um, but then, uh, well, I'm lying. Uh, George Lindsay was a, was alive. Reed Moran was alive. Um, and Fernando, um, um, not Fernando, sorry, um, Dr. Villa from Mexico City, who started the Isla Raza project, he was also alive at that time. They're all passed away now. Um, Bernardo, sorry, Bernardo Villa. Um, so yeah, I did meet some of the older, older generation that were still around. I, I, I met, of course, and there's a big name I, I have to mention, because I had the privilege of doing two trips with him to the Pinacate, um, with um, um, the archaeologist guy, Julian, uh, Julian Hayden. Julian Hayden, yeah. Hayden of course. Yeah, um, I had uh, I, I I I did two trips with um, with uh, Julian to the Pinacate, and in both trips we stopped in Sonoita, where he still had all his connections with uh, Tohono O'odham living in Sonoita. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it was really great and his old truck he had a 1945 Chevrolet that he still used mm -hmm. to go on his trips it was great anyway uh, and at that time also I realized that although I was doing my PhD at the University of Arizona mm -hmm. sorry at the University of of, uh, of North Wales uh, it was easier for me to go and check papers in the University of Arizona mm -hmm. so Normally, after doing field work, I would go to Tucson and spend some time reading things in the library and uh, doing my my library work at the University of Arizona. And by doing that, some of the people in Tucson started taking notice that this crazy Argent Mex, as we call ourselves, mm -hmm. was was coming frequently to Tucson and started inviting me. Mm -hmm. And that's how I met. Gary Nabam, who was finishing his PhD, also was doing his PhD at the um, um, Office for Arid Land Studies. Um, I met Richard Felger. I met Tom Van Demander. Um, you name it, I met all the guys of the Desert Museum, all that generation. Uh, Bill Broggs I met somewhat later, um, a few years later. Did but you meet Susan Anderson at that time? Uh, Susan Anderson, of course, and, and Peter Warren. Who were still boyfriends? <laughs> who were not married yet? They were studying under Jim Brown at the University of Arizona. Um, so I'm talking. This was between 1980 and 1984 when I finished my dissertation. Yeah, it was those four years. Um, We've heard quite a bit, um, and you've mentioned it here from the others we've interviewed, that those field experiences were really formative. Um, and maybe you could, sounds like you were describing the one with uh, Julian. Yeah. Maybe. Um, did you feel that that sort of was transformative in terms of what your knowledge and they were? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, since then it has become... Um, almost a ritual for me. I still do it with my own students. Like, in, in a week we're leaving, um, it's going to be Paul Dayton's, do you know Paul Dayton? He's at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He's also an Arizonan. He's an oceanographer, but Paul, when he was 15, he's going to be 70 next week. So, this <laughs> talks about 55 years. When he was 15, he went to the Pinacate and decided he was a high school student he would mark some plots to see how they changed with time. And he's followed these plots for 55 years. He has photographs of them, he has maps of the plants, he's mapped the plants that died, the ones that came in, etc. So we're going to Paul Dayton's plots to celebrate his 70th birthday, and all my younger students are coming also. Uh, but I've been doing that almost every year since, since then, not always to the Pinacate. Um, the year before that, last year was Maria's Islands, uh, 
Uh, the year before that was uh, Sierra de la Gigante and Baja, but I'm doing these field trips every year now. Um, and I've, I've kept them since, since then. It was really important. It was, it was amazingly important. And, you know, we are in the middle of a big discussion now here, and I think probably worldwide, with respect to these things. And I have to say this with a little bit of care. Last year, they asked me, here at the University of California, Riverside, to give a course that has a funny name of wildflowers. And it's basically a course on field botany, to take kids to the wild and to, uh, and also to take them to labs and to lead them to identify plants in the wild and to do natural history in the wild. And um, the reason they asked me to give this course because basically my commitment here is administrative. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have a pressure to do a course, especially a course for 150 undergrads, um, is because there is not a single researcher in Riverside that can recognize the local flora in, 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 in botany and plant sciences. And you say, well, that might be Riverside, but at least we have a herbarium. I'm getting emails from kids in UCSD University of California, San Diego, where like all biology now is molecular, sending me photographs of common plants, like um, the lemonade berry bush uh, or the laurel sumac, asking me what they are because they need to identify them for courses because they don't have a single researcher in, they don't even have a herbarium, they don't have a single researcher in, um, in uh, San Diego that they can ask uh, for the names of those of those plants. Um, Richard Felger, it seems to me, plays a really important part here because he is a botanist who's got, is grounded very much in the field and field uh, representation and reflections about things. Uh, it seems that for a lot of people this is an intermix of not just the physical landscape and the plants and animals themselves, but also the kind of uh, human connections they make with people like you or with people like Richard Felker uh, that sort of cements them to the region and to networks that work in the region. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, it is. Uh, I personally give fieldwork an incredible importance as a formative part of biology. But the reason why I'm saying this is because the other day we had a discussion in the department uh, uh, Paul Dayton from Scripps calls this problem, he's a marine biologist, I mean he was the first guy to dive in Antarctica, the first guy ever. He's, he's like a, a, a legend in, in, uh, in uh, biological sciences and he calls this the ADD, sorry NDD, Nature Deficit Disorder. He says that our students can get a graduate degree and then a PhD without actually in biological or environmental sciences without actually being in the field only once. And he says that, and I agree with that, that the field is like incredibly formative because it will give you a perspective of things that you don't get by doing things in the lab alone. And it's not that we are against the lab. And it will also give you a certain level of humility that, you know, if you are in the lab getting genes from one plant into another, you think that you can be God and you can do anything with, uh, with nature. But if you are out there in nature and you realize how rich nature is, how diverse natural ecosystems are, uh, how complex their functioning is, it gives you a, a perspective and a humility that is very difficult to get otherwise. But we have this discussion now, most of our universities have shied away from that. I saw this happening, the first one to do it, and it was for me like a very painful experience, was the University of Arizona mm -hmm. in the 80s. Yes. When they started um, getting rid, that's where Richard Felger applied for a position and he didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's difficult to imagine any biologist that is more influential in, in the Sonoran Desert ecology than Richard Felger. Mm -hmm. 
and he just didn't get a position because he was not interested in theoretical evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, the University of Arizona started getting rid of all its old field biologists, which was like the biggest asset of Arizona, mm -hmm. really. Why did people know internationally Arizona? Because of uh, Tumamok Hill, because of the Desert Laboratory, because of the Office for Island Studies, mm -hmm. because of Charles Lowe, mm -hmm. uh, because of all those guys. Mm -hmm. And um, even Jim Brown, who is now one of the most prominent members of the National Academy of Sciences, left Arizona in disgust mm -hmm. uh, because of this trend. Mm -hmm. um, but many universities went into that trend under the belief that uh, going molecular would bring money, that doing fieldwork was like like a romantic endeavor of nine, of the 19th century and not mm -hmm. something in any way relevant to modern times. And there's been an incredible loss because of that. Well, we've talked so far about sort of networks among researchers, but we haven't really talked much to about uh, the networks outside the researchers to public officials and uh, to uh, interest groups and political actors. Uh, to organizations. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how your work, uh, particularly with the early Biosphere Reserve, uh, served to make a, a broader kind of network with... Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, that's a very really dangerous question to ask me, Helen, because I can speak forever on that one. Well, maybe uh, you want to... Do you want to narrow it a little bit, Gwen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll do just fine. Um, yeah. I've always been fascinating, fascinated sorry, by certain junctures in time and history. And one that was incredibly important was in the 1970s, following the success of the International Geophysical Year, there was a huge international program to understand the geophysics of the Earth that happened in the late 50s, in 1957 and 58. In the early uh, 60s, there was this program that was established that was called IBP, the International Biological Program. And one of the results of IBP was that a number of researchers from Europe and the United States came out to developing countries. And that changed their perspective in an amazing way. Those were the years when Dan Jansen started coming to Veracruz first and then to Costa Rica. Um, and there was this Italian guy, Francesco Di Castri, who came to Chile, started doing work in, in Chile. And there were many, many others. Richard Levins from Harvard was doing work in, in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, Barbara McClintock, who later became a Nobel Prize winner for her work on the genetics of corn, was doing field work in Mexico with Efrain Hernandez Xolocotzi, and so on and so forth. It, the, it was an amazingly rich uh, period in which American researchers came to developing countries and forged relationships and alliances with developing countries. And one of the things that came out of that was the idea that A, nature needed protection, and B, that the traditional approach to conservation, to protection, based on uh, the American paradigm of national parks, wouldn't work in other places because you had native peoples, and I'm using the plural for peoples on purpose, um, uh, living in those areas. And if you wanted to preserve places like the Amazon or the Chaco Forest or the Pantanal, you had to take those persons into consideration and integrate them into conservation plans. Very shortly after the International Biological Program ended, which was around 1972-73, um, many of these researchers that have been doing fieldwork in Latin America came back to their own countries or to Europe or to the United States and, and got important positions. In particular, Francesco Di Castri uh, got a, a position in, in UNESCO. And that's when he started with his friends in Latin America, uh, the Man and the Biosphere program. And the idea you have, Wendy, I would really love you to see one of the posters that Andrea has in her office. They produce these long series of uh, huge posters indicating what the conundrums for conservation were. And the idea was behind biosphere reserves. They created this concept of biosphere reserves. And they said, if you want to have an area very well protected, you have to surround it 
by areas where people are managing the resources sustainably. Because otherwise, uh, if you keep an area like fenced, somebody will cut the fence and go into the area and cut the trees, cut the mahogany or, or poach the game or whatever. So they came with this idea of biosphere reserves that uh, the paradigm was A, it had to include native groups using sustainably the area or local groups using sustainably the area. B, it had the concept of sustainability. This is years before the concept became ma mainstream. Uh, it defined sustainable use. And lastly, it had a global approach to it. The idea was we have to create these type of reserves in all the different biomes in the world in order to protect a significant proportion of the germplasm of the biological diversity of the whole biosphere. That's why they were called biosphere reserves, uh, because it was a network. So the whole idea of that the Man in the Biosphere program uh, promoted was out of a network. Uh, it, was, it was embedded in the original concept that conservation wouldn't make progress without networking. And this office is crazy, you get all these type of things. Um, so around that, people doing conservation in Mexico that became attracted to the UNESCO concept of the man and the biosphere, almost naturally start networking with, with other people. And how, that's how a lot of the networking around the, the Sonoran Desert Initiative, the Sonoran Desert Conservation Areas uh, started, really. I don't know if I answered your question, Ellen. No, you did very well. Thank you. Um, in talking about the kind of uh, people involved in this network, uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the binational dimension at a time when there's not uh, a lot of support for um, relationships between the United States and Mexico. It seems to us that this conservation network has uh, continued to be quite robust. Yes. Um, do you have some insight as, as to how that has happened? Yeah. Well, I, for, uh, I suddenly remembered what I wanted to mention. There's one person I want to pay homage here. And it, it talks about, um, or the, the, the whole thing uh, highlights the importance of commitment and working with governmental officers. In uh, 1992, I was a researcher at the University of Mexico, and I got a phone call. And one of my students in the lab answered the phone, and he turned around and said, Ezequiel, it's Luis Donaldo Colosio who's calling. And Colosio was, had been appointed at that time by President Salinas, the Minister of Social Development and the Environment. And I thought it was a joke first, uh, because uh, since I left Argentina, I had had no uh, connections with politicians of any sort, or with party politics of any sort. Anyway, I took the phone and it was him, and he had read my papers, uh, not all my papers, he had read a couple of things I had written and he was very interested in, in my ideas and he invited me to talk with him and I went to talk with him and he invited me to work with him. And that's how I started working with Colossium. And a number of things happened. I had just, at, the, at that time, well, some, some years had passed since I had finished doing my work in the Pinacate. And my initial work in the Pinacate, I have to say, was a failure because we did give Ocaña the proposal to make uh, the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve. But then, of course, the project was backstabbed by people in Hermosillo who resented that people in Mexico City had done the project on how to protect uh, a significant part of the Sonoran uh, Desert. And they badmouthed the whole idea of biosphere reserves, and Ocaña became concerned that he would get a backlash in um, in his own state if he promoted the idea of a biosphere reserve in the Pinacate and he just, the whole project stalled. So the project that was given to Ocaña in 1984 just stalled, it didn't move forward. In 1992 I started working with Colosio eight years later and he still had all the information on the Pinacate. And um, I talked with him and these were the years of the free trade agreement and the whole discussion about, uh, uh, you know, bringing the Mexican economy, uh, tying the Mexican economy to the U.S. and Canadian economies, 
and he said, is there anything we can do in conservation that will sort of underscore our commitment to joint work? I said, well, there is not a single protected area along the border because historically the Mexican government has been concerned of making protected areas along the border uh, because they feel that they have there might be a sovereignty issue in having wide, empty areas along the border. They prefer to occupy them with people. That would have been a, a tradition in the Mexican government. I said, but really we have beautiful areas along the border that need protection and need a commitment for conservation. And he said, like, which ones? And I said, well, why not the Pinacate? The project has been there for a long time. And he loved it because he was from Magdalena. He, he had the same thing I had. He had been raised in the desert. He was a desert rat himself. And, um, and he loved it and that's how the whole project uh, started and how the whole, suddenly the networking that we had established 10 years before while working with Pinacate started making a lot of sense because a lot of people started giving information and uh, providing more data, providing maps and satellite images. In those 10 years a lot of things have changed, especially in relation to satellite images and remote sensing and things like that, and the whole project uh, came, came forward. Now, in relation to your question, Helen, at that time binational cooperation was critical. It, was, uh, it wouldn't have happened without uh, binational cooperation, without a commitment from both sides of the border. We had, um, shortly after the, uh, even at the time it was created, Susan Anderson was very committed with this, and then later they created the TNC, the Sparks in Peril program that was very supportive of the Pinacate. There was a huge commitment from both sides of the border to get these things off the ground and, 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 uh, and working. And the Pinacate was like the seed for many others because then came uh, together with the Pinacate, as a matter of fact. It started a little bit later, but it was decreed at the same time. We had the Alto Golfo, and then of course other projects arose for Santa Elena Canyon and the Rio Bravo and um, uh, the Maderas del Carmen south of Big Bend and a number of other um, sister park projects started uh, developing very, very rapidly. Uh, so it was really a, a great, great project. Now, now I'm going to your question, Ellen. We're living bad times now. We're, 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 we're living, uh, binationally we're living bad, bad times and, uh, you know, personally I'm heading an organization whose mission is to promote binational cooperation and binational understanding and I can see it. Uh, at the same time, one thing I always mention both here and in Mexico is we have around 3,000 kilometers, over 3,000 kilometers of border between our two countries. And for Mexicans, the United States will not go away. And for the United States, Mexico will not go away. So we can act as if the other didn't exist, or we can pretend to build huge walls. Uh, but the truth is that the two countries are together. They, they share too long a border to live in, in isolation. From each other, and and that's really the big challenge we have now is is uh, convincing our decision makers to understand what is going on and to try and and get a better collaborative uh, stance on on binational issues. And personally, I think that the environment is a great opportunity for this because that's an area where you can achieve success and generate success stories. Uh, that we need so so desperately, really, at this at this stage. One of the things that um, we heard a bit about was that the relationships that had been established in the time frame that you're talking about have propelled a lot of the conservation, even the upper Gulf work that's happening now, but that there's a shift in the ability to bring people from Mexico, as was so critical in those early days, to work at U of A, for example, Bill Shaw has talked about difficulty, and, and um, especially to Arizona, um, and that, that there's a longer term projection of those relationships then not being there. Yes. Uh, fortunately, 
Let me touch wood here. <laughs> Fortunately, that's an Arizona problem and not a generalized U.S. problem. Mm -hmm. um, there was an article in the journal Science signed by Joaquin Ruiz and Jose Antonio de la Peña. Joaquin Ruiz from the University of Arizona. He's, he's the Dean of Sciences. Mm -hmm. And Jose Antonio de la Peña from the Mexican Council for Science and Technology talking about this. Mm -hmm. Because what happened was that as positions against immigrants in Arizona started becoming harder and harder, uh, a number of things happened, but one was that agreements and uh, cooperative agreements and ongoing programs between the University of Arizona and universities in Mexico were canceled mm -hmm. by universities in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so we are repeating with Arizona what happened with uh, the administration of George Bush after 9 one one mm -hmm. But there was a year, I think it was 2003, where there were way more Mexican students going to do PhDs in Australia than they were coming to do PhDs in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, because getting a visa was so difficult and it was so humiliating the way people were treated, like they were all terrorists. I, I understand the intentions of many uh, officials in the American government being harsh when giving a visa uh, because they believe they're actually protecting American soil. But the truth is that not a single act of terrorism has come from Mexico, and that by humiliating Mexican students in the act of getting visas just uh, made Australia be the winner. Mm -hmm. uh, Australia has got the, the best crop of Mexican mines going to study there, and some have stayed in Australia. Mm -hmm. So what used to be a major driver of recruitment and enrichment intellectual enrichment in the United States halted for a while. It was stopped by a wonderful woman, I forget her name, who's the um, chancellor at Harvard. She wrote a letter to George Bush indicating the problems they were having to recruit. This was not, of course, only Mexico, but uh, Mexico for, for me at that time, it was in Mexico, was, was uh, like the most vivid example. Um, how, how difficult it was becoming for American universities to become, to recruit the brightest and the uh, most intelligent minds when the immigration system was, was working against them. Uh, that has stopped, fortunately, quite a bit in the, at the federal level, but in Arizona it's still a big problem. Arizona is finding it difficult to recruit students because existing projects uh, that, um, or ongoing projects to send students to study in, in Arizona have been frozen mm -hmm. by many Mexican universities. That is not happening here. We're still recruiting a significant number of uh, Mexican students and, and doing well, and I hope, I hope we, uh, I'm still able, I've been doing some work with the California legislature to let them know that this is important. This, this is like the only umbilical we have now between the two countries. If this is cut off, if, if uh, having students going and coming and studying in both countries, uh, then the, um, uh, the severing of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the two cultures can be really bad. I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about that. But, uh, but, but fortunately, this is not happening here. In Arizona, it is a big problem. Um, and I pity Joaquin and uh, all the guys in, 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 at the University of Arizona, because it's one of these issues in which, as we say in Spanish, justos pagan por pecadores. Uh, the rightful ones uh, pay uh, for the sinners. Mm -hmm. um, I can just follow up on that just a little bit, because in talking to some other people, they talk about there almost being two cultures, this sort of culture of suspicion uh, and otherness and confrontation, and then this other culture of collaboration, which they see as fairly deep-seated and something that may transcend this period of time. As we've been talking about it in the last few minutes, uh, we seem to talk about threats to the future because new ties are not being forged. On the other hand, do you see some continuation of these old ties? After all, there's some good things happening, such as the agreement on the lower Colorado. What do you think? Yeah. 
you know, when I first came to California to the Natural History Museum, I normally didn't miss an opportunity uh, telling what at that time believed were the culturally superior, somewhat arrogant Californians what a good job historically Arizona had done in cooperating with uh, with Mexico. Uh -huh. uh, and that is true. I mean, just, you know, all the examples I was giving a while ago, just look at the Desert Lab, at uh, the people working out of Tumamoc Hill, forestry, riding on horseback, all this amazing photograph in, in the Vizcaino Desert, uh, all these things going on. Uh, Arizona had for years been a, 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 a stalwart, the, 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 the flagship of cooperation. And not only with uh, Mexico, a lot of desert ecologists, uh, the older generations, most of them are now very old or have passed away uh, from South America, came to study in, in, uh, in U of A. Or the University of Arizona was really a reference, mm -hmm. um, the measuring rod for desert ecology throughout the world, and especially in Mexico and South America. I, I don't think that spirit will go away uh, rapidly. Um, I hope it will it will stay and it will it will come back. Um, but I don't know. Uh, Arizona has changed so much in the last um, um, thirty years since since I first started going to Tucson, uh, and now of course the Julian Hayden types are are so rare, and you have all these new people that have come. You know, Gary Napham's nightmare, his dire predictions, you know, you bring or, or uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people come and settle in Phoenix, uh, coming from the Northeast or from the East Coast or from uh, other states, and they don't understand the desert, they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the indigenous peoples that coexist within that culture. They don't understand the strong Mexican component, and all they want is a swimming pool, a lawn, and have their Mexicans as far away as possible. And uh, there's there's been this this new migration has brought in uh, uh, the the way I, I see it, and uh, this is not a scientific observation; it's just a, a a subjective observation, a feeling of otherness that was not there. Uh, 30 years ago, and it certainly was not there a century ago. There was a time, I, I wrote it once, I think uh, something I wrote for the Lannan Foundation um, in New Mexico. There was a time in which, uh, you know, and I lived that time, I could cross from the Pinacate on foot into Organ Pipe, and the rangers knew me. There was no border patrol there. Mm -hmm. The rangers knew me, and they know I was. Uh, uh, the, the, the guy from the University of Mexico working in the Pinacate will go to Quito Baquito to drink water and, and uh, sit by the shade of the cornwoods and then go into, into organ pipe and collect. No problem. You would get to, uh, in, in 1979, 1980, you could go to Sonoita, Lukeville, and tell the border patrol guy, hey, you know, with your car and everything, I'm going here into Lukeville or into Ajo or into the Y to buy some stuff at the grocery and I'll be right back and say, yeah, go, go ahead. They wouldn't even ask you for a visa. You could do it all. There was this feeling of, of togetherness. It was, it was the same neighborhood. Um, that has changed very, very strongly now, unfortunately. I'm going to ask one last question, um, which is, I think the other thing we've heard quite a bit about is just the safety of going to Mexico now for field research and that it's just not, as you say, and not only is there difficulty coming to the U.S. and kind of the barriers that have been erected, but the fact that at the border now it's pretty difficult. Uh, David Yetman mentioned that. Uh, Bill Broyles has mentioned that. Others have said they're not as free to go as they used to be. I agree. I really want to, and I do feel work in Mexico all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the Cut in a week from now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but things have changed badly in Mexico. But you know, if you ask me, Wendy, about this again, I think that is one of these, as we say in Spanish, conversación de sordos, a conversation of deaf people. 
the president of Mexico, who is a person I don't actually admire too much, he's not my cup of tea in many things, he went naively into this drug war without actually analyzing the consequences. And I think he expected the U.S. to support him. And that hasn't happened. Uh, you know, this new thing with the Fast and Furious operation, have you read about that? Mm -hmm. This shows the level of utter incapacity to understand each other. Uh, the U.S. Is, is pressed by a number of terrible issues, uh, complicated issues, an, an economy that stubbornly doesn't want to take off again, complicated financial times, international issues, a war in Afghanistan, a war in Iraq, and they just couldn't care less about Mexico and about the drug war. So there is a tolerance for drugs here in the States, who is uh, really the major demand uh, for, for, for drugs from South America and from Mexico. Um, and the problem in some way implicitly is passed to Mexico. And there is no acknowledgement of part of the, of the U.S. Of, of the issue this, this is. I mean, I see teenage schools, well now my daughter is in, is in, in, in college, but um, when, when she was in high school or even in middle school, you know, the kids buy marijuana or much worse stuff. Like it flows. Uh, and there is, you know, if they get caught with marijuana, it's just a slap in the hand. You get caught with marijuana in Mexico, you are sent by, by a completely crazy government to one of these horrible prisons where you, you won't know if you're going to come out. So we've sort of exported repression to Mexico. We're very tolerant here, but we have a huge level of tension. In, in Mexico around this issue, and a government that doesn't know how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it is clear that the arms that are being used by the drug dealers come from the United States. You may argue, you know, the, what is it, the Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms? I, I don't know what amendment it is, but anyway, that the U.S. honors the right to bear arms and they cannot do anything about that. But, but there is definitely a problem here. And, and now we learn that the American government, through the Tobacco and Farm, uh, Firearms Bureau, has been actually selling arms to the drug dealers. And there are arms that have been marked in order to be able to, quote, follow them. These two American members of the Immigration and Naturalization Service that were killed one in Tamaulipas, another one in the Arizona border. They were killed by arms mm, provided uh, with knowledge, sort of consciously provided by the American government to the drug dealers. So, you know, you look at this from the outside, we definitely have a problem here. And that is, that is, is, is really questioning not only the binational relationship, but the ability of Mexico to grow as a prosperous society. Um, it is very serious. You know, I used to go with my elder daughters around the time you, you met me for the first time. On weekends, we used to go to the mountains of Guerrero, uh, which are beautiful, uh, camp on camping trips. We used to take, I had a little Renault 4, one of these little, little French cars, and we used to put in a tent and some sleep, sleeping bags, and we would uh, up to the high part of the mountains with pine forest, and then into the cloud forest and all the way down into the mangroves. Hey, remember those trips? That's the best trips ever. We used to do them once a year. It was wonderful. You wouldn't, you wouldn't approach there. I mean, Guerrero is off hands, completely, a whole state. You can only go to Acapulco and two or three of the main cities. And all the rest is just in hands of the drug dealers with a huge level of violence. Um, there's definitely a problem here, but you know what it takes, what it would take? is the ability of two presidents to sit and talk and try to understand each other. And that is what I think 
has been lacking in recent times uh, between Mexico and the United States at the level of decision making. The honored tradition of just talking out problems and jointly deciding to do something about them. I think there is too much pressure in Mexico of this, I would call it schizophrenic in the strict sense of the word discourse of hating the United States that harbors at present some 30% of the Mexican population is living in the U.S. Uh, so there is not a single person in Mexico that doesn't have relatives in the U.S. and that doesn't in his own intimate, um, in, inside his heart, have an admiration for many aspects of the American culture. But openly, there is this, this incredibly aggressive discourse towards the, the United States, a total sort of chauvinistic, uh, patriotic discourse that doesn't help to improve things in any way. And I really think environment might be the exception to this, that there may be possibilities for collaboration. Yeah. I, things. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's what I think. Uh, I mentioned that a little while ago. I think uh, I really loved at one point the idea was being discussed of making a green border, um, you know, of protecting the border by by establishing joint protected areas instead of fences. But of course, that doesn't go well with the American right, which is almost as terrifying as uh, chauvinistic nationalism in Mexico, uh, the Minutemen and and uh, the extreme American right that are really vociferous at present. Um, and in the States, we seem to have a government that is afraid of that right, uh, of that sort of right-wing um, thinking. You know, Obama is always treading with great care as soon as he gets a group of right-wingers becoming overly vociferous. Mm -hmm. So we have a difficult uh, situation. But then, you know, one thing I tell people is, I, I, I've learned something which is, to develop a historic perspective. Or like a friend have, he said, we have no hurry, we have the whole of history uh, in front of us. Um, and, you know, when I worked in the Pinacate, we made the proposal for the protected area, and it took 10 more years to get it done. It just the time wasn't right, but we eventually got it done. And since then, and, and largely thanks to this experience, I've become an optimist, you know, like, you can do things, very often you can't do them at the speed and the pace and at the rates that you would like them to do them, but eventually you can do things. And I find it very difficult if you get a serious historic perspective and look at the United States with a huge proportion of Latino population that it has, and look at two countries with this incredible amount of shared borders, it's very difficult to imagine them in the future to continue ignoring each other, or acting as if the other one didn't exist, or trying to put more and more and more uh, fences and barriers and uh, things that uh, uh, separate both both countries. Sooner or la later, there must be uh, a reconciliation. And that's